So it's spring and we're off to the Kelling Heath Spring Star Party. So come and join me for some big scopes, some cool imaging rigs and observing under those dark Norfolk skies. <laughs> Cut out bits. Yep, so they just lift it up and lock it in position. See what So welcome to the Refreshing Views Caravan. I'm up in Norfolk for the Spring Star Party. Now this is an event they hold every year. There's one in the spring and there's one in the autumn. The spring one's kind of chilled out. There's no talks, there's a handful of trade stands. So it's a much more sort of quieter affair. But it's really pleasant. I've got all my stuff set up. I've had a look through some big scopes as well. So I drove for, I think it was left the house at 10, got here at half three with a lunch break and a, and a fuel stop. And I literally just got out of the car and went into the caravan and made a cup of tea. There's nothing else to do. And I didn't have a tent to put up, camp bed, all that sort of thing. So the heating's on. Just bought the kettle. I'm going to make a cup of tea. Last night was really nice, actually. We had very clear patches. And then very the, the next rain fronts and the next squall would come in. And so we had to quickly dive into the caravan, have another cup of tea, and then go back outside. So I had a good look at some of the classics. And then, yeah, did a sketch of Kemble's Cascade. And then by about two in the morning, I was done in and it was another squall. So I, I called it a night there. But it's not looking too bad now. So fingers crossed, we'll get back outside and do some observing. Yeah. And it's, and it's, and it's, yeah, actually, funny yeah. enough. So I'm with Daniel. Ah. And Daniel has built this wonderful, what's it? So I can see on there, 16 inch F4.5. So did you make this yourself? Yeah, it's uh, just basically a clone of the uh, Obsession Ultra Compact uh, 15 inch. So it's a little bit slightly bigger, uh, but effectively it's it's a, a close as I can possibly do it, a clone. So um, how big does this all collapse down into? So this is why you built it, so it's ultra compact, ultra transportable. Yeah, that's right. It's just, uh, the little tiny hatchback I still have. So it's all got to be sort of folds up. and. So all that and your camping kit. Two tents. Two tents. Oh, because you've got your imaging rig. Yeah. And your beer bottles. And the beer. <laughs> so yeah, it's just great fun. So whilst the imaging is tonk, you know, its way through, I can... Uh... And I was just admiring your secondary cover. Yeah, it's a sock. A clean, a clean sock? Yeah, it's a clean sock. It's just, uh, you know, I just heard that it makes it quite a good secondary cover and I've uh, been using it ever since. No problem. So re you've really sort of just simplified the design just to a this skeleton tube, yes. skeleton assembly. Yeah, I think there's about seven wooden parts total. And uh, they all got machined up for me by um, a furniture maker in Hertfordshire. And the metal parts again were laser cut for me. Uh, and I slowly assembled all the bits that I needed. Wow. And um, bolted it all together. That so, is yeah, amazing. Really enjoyed doing it as well. So you, did you? So how, you routed out the plywood bearings, or did you get them made? Everything was made up for you. Everything was made up for me. I did uh, a lot of like chopping. For example, the um, the horseshoe shaped pieces of wood they came as a complete uh, set, and I had to cut them. Oh, was it? And they bo oh, and they clip fold. together. So they fold like the uh, ultra compact, and and uh, that's just a complete copy. Um, but I machine my own metal parts. Oh, you did your own machining? Oh, wow. Yeah. So all the clips and the this arrangement here is all I did all that that's so clever isn't it and the uh, mirror cell as well is just uh, you know, holds on to <gasps> the actual wooden parts so did you weld, you weld the steel or is that Ali or what's it's steel steel frame that's all welded and then powder, powder coated afterwards wow that's beautiful isn't it you can do that by hand would you you'd be no no I, uh, I um, had a guy, a really good welder, to actually uh, weld that up for me. And what about the, where did you get the mirror from? This is uh, from a Mead Starfinder. So, is that what you used? Yeah, so one of these sort of like original Mead 
it came out of one of those big sort of concrete fill tubes and the concrete fill Just tube disintegrates <laughs> after a while. And so there's a lot of these 16 inch mirror sets all banging around because... Um, oh, because the telescope's disintegrated. Yeah, because the telescope's in there, the optics are great. And then, um, yeah, I bought it off of a guy that I met uh, at the, uh, at the um, Isle of Wight show. Yeah. And uh, I bought it off of him and it sat underneath my bed for a year and a bit and then I put it all together and <laughs> built into a scope. So you took the optics out and then threw the structure away and then built the better structure? I didn't, I didn't even have the, st the structure, I just got, I got the, the, the oh, primary and the, and the secondary and that and was, that was it. it. And then you put the focuser on Yeah. Paracore as well? No, 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 I don't no, need it. Not for the... Cause no, yeah, the, for I, I can't see. I can, I, for the, no benefit? Uh, no benefit, no. No, from the eyepieces I use, it's absolutely fine. And then you've got encoders as well? Yeah, yeah, encoders? push two encoders and they're just uh, rig up to a um, Sky Commander. So that's your, so it's not motorised, so it's up, down, left, right. It's push two. Push two, so, but you know where it is. Yeah. And you were observing that first night when it was about 30, it was, air temperature was about yeah. minus two, and then there was a 20 mile an hour wind. Th that's right. Was it gusting 40? Yeah, but I mean, like, you know, it's so hollow that the wind just rips straight through it and doesn't affect it too much. So that's the advantage of having a sort of like really open structure like that. Um, and yeah, I love it. I use so it. So everyone else was packed up and you were still out here observing because yeah. <laughs> the transparency when it's clear oh, yeah, is yeah, yeah. really clear isn't it that yeah. rain's washed everything out that's right so, so while you're imaging in that one which well is yeah this, i mean this is why like i enjoy doing a bit of both if i can so i'll set the imaging rig up to do what it wants to do and whilst it's sort of taking the photographs i can get busy with this nice it's a work in progress it's nowhere near finished i mean there's all is sorts it not? of things no there's loads of things i haven't got a um a light shield here I'd like to put a little bit of a baffle on the back end of it as well. Um, well, so how does it cope with dew and um, stray lights? It's, it's okay. I mean, um, the, I have problems with the secondary dewing up, but I've got a, a heater in there. This has got a heater as well. I've got a heater in there, but I haven't rigged it up. That's the other thing I need. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, the dew dew heaters. And I got one in the tail rad as well, but again, I, I haven't got yet to yeah link it so up. So it works. Together. So you have a shroud. I did make a shroud for it. Um, if it's a six pole range, but it's a little bit tricky. Try to make sure it doesn't sag in them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It sags here. So I have got a little arrangement here that you flip round like that, and it rigs up onto this point here. So it lifts it out, provides the an anchor point. But I haven't used the shroud in a long time. So you're right with it because it's quite damp, though, isn't it? So. Yeah, I mean, I find that the primary doesn't do up so badly at all. Um, but it's the secondary that needs the heater. Really? Yeah. So, yeah, work in progress. So, I love this this arrangement, the um, this V-shaped. Yeah, the pyramid. Yeah, the pyramid. Pyramid of Giza. How did you make that? Did you weld that? This is uh, two-part superglue. Oh, is <laughs> that yeah. technical? Well, Brilliant. Yeah, they, I mean, they use it at aircraft wings, so it's good enough for a telescope secondary, so... Yeah. So this is just uh, effectively super glued into an aluminium spigot here right. at the central point. So is this all al aluminium? That's carbon fibre. Oh, it's... Oh, okay. it's nice and light then. Yeah, and that's aluminium. Right. This secondary holder is Astro Systems, I think, in the US. Yeah. And yeah, it sort of like uh, works quite nicely. But it's a very close copy of the um, obsession you see. And a nice focus here as well, then that must be yeah, nice I, to use. Yeah, 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 it works well. Yeah. yeah Telrad works. Telrad's the best bit, you know, it's pointing, just like, yeah, you can smash it all over the place. Yeah, brilliant, and know, the Telrad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I put, I put the heater, that's the other thing that really use up really a lot. Yeah. Is this. Have it's you got one of those horseshoe shaped heaters? Oh yeah, I've got the... Um, oh, there it is, yeah, because yeah. just sit on the inside. And... So it's all ready to go. <laughs> You've even got yeah. a connector on it. So I need, I need the power pack is the uh, thing that I want to buy next. Once I've got the power pack, I've got everything else. I've got the controller. How long did it take to build? Well, it took me a couple of years to work out what I needed and where to get it from. And then it took me about 10 months to put together a very rough first yeah. draft. Yeah. And then a few months to sort of tweak it a little bit further. 
so the whole top end has been redesigned it used to have a lot thicker wood um, a metal pyramid and I just changed that around just to lighten the top end it's, yeah. it's a little bit top end heavy right so any weight that I can stick at the back end is good yes and anything I can lighten up on this end is good so more tweaks well, it's, yeah, more so fun <laughs> So what's the what have you looked at then this week? What, have, what did you look at when the clear skies? Snowball, uh, MY2182. Oh, that's always nice. 637, um, so It's almost like a greatest hit of the spring sky, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah, and uh, galaxies and Mark Aaron's chain, and that's about it. Can we have a look at the imaging, Luke? Oh, I say that's nice, isn't it? Is that a prime lens or a scope? What scope. Pentax is it? It's all there. 75S. Oh, very nice. So you literally just leave this rubbing. Yeah. Line it up and then you set the dob up and then you... Rip. So you're capturing photons and photons. Yeah. yeah. So what have you been imaging? I imaged the Mark Herod's chain. Oh, um, lovely. But I only managed to get two minute, one two minute exposure <laughs> and then it all like uh, clouded over. So that was the end of it. Do you need a hand? Yeah, you can. I'll feed it down. How'd you find these covers? Okay. They're all right. They're, uh, this one's a bit big, but... But it keeps the heat off, doesn't it, with that reflective coating? Yeah, that's right. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah thank right. you, Dan. That's really appreciated. That one, eh? Let's have a go see what that does. It's pretty good though. It's not bad. Good. It's no, lovely, it I think. Very good, very impressive with that. But oh, that thing down there. The, I've uh, seen it. I've seen you, um, I think yesterday, yeah, playing yeah. with it. <laughs> no, this morning actually. Because you packed it this morning, no? Yeah. I've, I've yes, I've seen you. Just... And then inside mm. is a solar scope, two inch, you know, 50 mil filter. Right. But um, it's got telecentric lenses either side so that it makes use of the almost the full aperture of this refractor. So in effect it's a hundred mil diameter solar scope with a fifty mil cheap cheaper filter. Not that cheap. But um, it, it kind of works. It, it has its disadvantages. Mm. But I usually use this with a camera bolted onto it yes. in the garden. And it's all controlled remotely. Because actually using it visually is um, well it, yeah, it's a bit awkward. Um, but actually I've I sort of forget how good it is to use visually, and then I can't do more of it. And the mounts, the telescope's about, I suppose the eyepiece would be about that high, so quite comfortable. Yeah, but the sun is always good, it's nice and warm. That's right. And knob twiddling, mm -hmm. a bit more. But these um, coated etalons... But I didn't see any of them. So we're at the spring star party. Yes. And it's finally stopped snowing. The minus 10 degree wind chill has ended. So Julian has set up his 20 inch telescope. And you remember the Orpington? Yes, Orpington Astronomical Society. The provisional wing of the Orpington Astronomical Society. And partly Crayford <laughs> Astronomical Society. So you made this yourself? I this did. A... And the mirrors, you ground the mirrors? Not the mirror. No, I, got, I bought this mirror second hand. But you made the, the secondary? The, I see you got the nice curved yeah. secondary. I made, made, yeah, I did make the fines. Uh, I bought the the, the uh, mount here, and I bought the uh, secondary mirror. So what's it made out? Of? What wood did you use? Uh, Baltic birch. And then painted it purple or stained it's, it. This it's purple been stained. Actually, it was stained. This part of it was stained blue, and the rest of it was stained purple. But I didn't like the blue, so then I went over it with red. <laughs> And so how did you make the shroud? Were you busy on the sewing machine or did you buy uh, that in? No, the shroud was made by Lorraine's aunt and it's made, made out of uh, clap material, non-rip material and um, nylon rods that I bought from Screwfix. Is that right? I think they are for, yeah, for uh, electrician's rods I think they're called. Is that right? So how's it coping the wind then? So it's quite a windy day isn't it? Is it? It does shake but it's not, it's not too bad. It doesn't behave like a kite and... No, no. Uh, when it's been really windy, I have taken the shroud off, but I get a little bit scared because the mirror becomes unprotected. Of course, yeah. Can you talk us through the cooling fans? Then you put some. So these are to cool the mirror, aren't they? Get rid of the heat haze coming off the. Yes. So we've got four four fans. 
uh, yeah. run at two speeds, uh, high speed and low speed, and and we've got one at one at the back, which runs at high speed, just to cool the fan down, just to cool the mirror down. So do you use it when you're observing, or do no, you do it? No. So I can't remember how many you point. I think it's 27 point. Oh, look at that. So did you, I mean, you literally were cutting aluminium. Uh, yes. Aluminium. Uh, aluminium. Aluminium. Uh, aluminium. Aluminium. They don't call it titanium, do they? Or helium? No. It's helium and aluminium. So, so, so you, can do some, you can go to the gym with this and looking at these counterweights. Oh, yes. So the base ones are made out of uh, eight mil aluminium and the other bits that fit to the mirror are six mil aluminium. So did you, I mean, were you hand cutting out or did you get that cut? Oh, the oh, I, I cut them on a bandsaw and then burnt the bearing out. <laughs> <Did you> <laughs> so I've replaced the bearing now. Better than wearing yourself out, cutting all that, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. I think I did the last two on uh, on a jigsaw and then had to, had to sand it down to match the others. And so they're all on this floating point, aren't they, it with is, all trees yep. and all that? Uh, yep, I think it's 27 po floating point. Uh, so how thick's the mirror? To... The mirror is 45 centimetres thick and it's a 20, 20 inch of four. So 20, I'm trying to do that's half, and it's 50 mil thick, did you say? Yeah, about 40, 45 so it's 10 to 1, isn't it? So yeah, yeah, it's a thin mirror, isn't it? So no wonder you need the... the set. And that's the fan there in the centre, just to keep it all cool. Yes, and, and, and you won't be able to see the four fans, but they, they blow across the mirror. Oh, OK. And so you turn these off when you're observing, just to get yes. rid of the vibration? Yes. It's an open tube, so I guess once it's reached ambient, it's... Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's dewed up. It does dew up, uh, but you can usually blow it blow it out. Or oh, so the, the fan also helps yeah. the tube, does it? Yeah. Sometimes I've, I've had to put the fans on, and if the fan do, doesn't work, I uh, put an uh, air blower on it. Oh, just, yeah, give it a good blast. So that little cover then just clipped on with magnets, didn't it? Yes. The little kitchen magnets. And then you've got the collimation screws? Yeah, these are the collimation screws. There, there, there. And on here, we have... Oh yes, this is the interesting bit, isn't it? So this isn't just a... It's not push to, it's, yeah. uh, it's go to, and it tracks. So you built it, you bought this, haven't you? You bought the, the I bought drive. the tracking system, yeah. Bought the drive system. The drive system is uh, a scope dog, which is quite, which is very good. So that's made by Keith Venables, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah. And the good thing about coming to a star party is that Keith's there, is that he gives you all the upgrades ah. and software refreshes and... Great customer service. <laughs> Especially, well, we, I found him brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Here's, here's scope dog here. So that's all the brains of it, is there's it? The, there's the control box, the, ba the battery sits there. And, and that's it. Uh, and we've got the, mo the motors. I've put covers on the motors. So the motors are underneath there, which is what, oh, one there it. and one there. So instead of having to manually star hop whilst up a ladder. It, 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 it can do both. So here we have the... Uh, the motor's engaged now on so the drive belt. On the drive belt, so we you can so have that as a clutch. Yeah, and then you can you can still drive it around still the sky. Still drive it around the sky because that the, the the base plates on the, a lazy Susan, so it's on three different plates. So one drive plate, one lazy Susan. So you can actually move it That's beautiful. manually or drive it. So what's this big long black metal arm then? You got you got coming from the wheelbarrow handles. Is that 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 is a wheelbarrow handle, which is this handle here goes in there, and then I can move it along. Well, that same, obviously saves your back on the same the other side. So Gene's just run to the back of the van now to go and get his other wheelbarrow handle. Does this? So now you can move it around, load it at the back of the van. Run around the field. If something, some van's in the way, I'll just move it out yeah, of the way. Yeah, perfect. Move the telescope. So what's on this well, music stand? This is for your violin practice or? Ah, right. On here is the iPad, which uh, connects to your planetarium software. Oh, I can see my camera. There's a few little snowflakes just going past. Yeah. And the Nexus. So you can, once you've done your two star alignment, you can ask it to go to what, M M13. And what it does, it does a countdown, and you can put it to M13 or go into your planetarium software. 
go in 13, go to. So it does it all for it you. Does both. So what's the, what, what have you seen then during when you've been here at Kelly? Maybe not this because it was so all cold. All the lovely windy. lollipops. All the spring, spring galaxies and... Yes. Uh, galaxies look uh, very nice. M, 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 M8182. Yeah. I can't remember to you the truth. There's been so many. Orion looks lovely in this. Uh, M13 looks great. How long did it take you to make it? I would say about a year. But it wasn't full time. A year of evenings and weekends. Weekend, or... Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of circles, cut, cutting a lot of circles with, with a router, basically. I think our record was seven galaxies in the field of view at one time, wasn't it? Yes. Carrying some chain. So you built this as well, then, Julian? Yes. It's uh, fully adjustable. Uh, so it's just on those little circly cutout bits. Yep. So they just lift it up. And lock it in position. So whatever height your eyepiece is, and whatever height, however yeah. tall the observer is, so you can go whatever height, just like that. And then perch your posterior. You need a bit of cushioning on that. It must be cold at two in the morning when you. Oh, it depends. Not when you've got your thermal trousers on. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're down here, then, so if you're looking something low on the horizon, your eyepiece is low. You could. Yeah. Make sure you're locked in. Really bright white. Before the bottom, bottom meets your ankles. <laughs> That's comfortable, isn't it? Yes. And then, yeah. if your eyepiece is up at the zenith... Yeah. Oh, it feels high risk. Just get that to the... Yeah, to, oh, I might go down there a bit. You can lift the legs up. The, 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 the leg support up Oh, the well. that comes with it. Oh, sorry. Okay. On top of the world. So big thanks to Julian for showing us around the telescope. We just had to dive back into the caravan. Have a look at this weather. So this is spring at a star party in England. Look at this down. It is absolutely checking it down. So at first I've been using the big binoculars, the APM 100mm binoculars. And that's really because we've been dodging these snow flurries as they've come in, so they're quick to set up and quick to pack away. But I also want to use my new, well new to me, my Megre 890, and then also set up the barn door tracker. Not to do any imaging or anything like that, just to get some nice time lapses of other people observing. I'm also going to test out my new polar alignment wedge and just see how it works under dark skies. I've got some few improvements I want to make before I do a detailed build. So if you want to see more of this, then don't forget to subscribe. So, if you've got your camera, ordinary camera tripod, yeah. then you, you've got the up, down, left, right thing me, Bob. Uh, yep. But it kind of wobbles a little bit. So I thought this is just a literally got the three eighths bad um, camera tripod nut. It pops you in. So that is really cool. What I've done is I've used a wood hinge, and the problem I found was that when I lined that up with Polaris on an ordinary camera tripod you, you couldn't quite adjust it smoothly no. so I can now fine-tune that just by yeah, yeah. screwing the thread and it's got a piece of elastic so I can point that roughly towards Polaris and go Ooh, up down left to right a bit and then I can undo that and then you can just smooth it it's on the little channel yeah, so it's, I'm not I'm not after you know 100 you know no. all I need to do is move it a few degrees up and a few degrees left and right ah, yeah. So that leads up there, and then I made one out of plywood, and then 3D printed one once I got all the measurements right. Is that flaggy then, plastic? Yeah, it's plastic. And that has got a, yeah, a nut in. Well, yeah. So that goes on. So that then screws on like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is now just really stable. So right. when I line that out, so you literally line that roughly up with Polaris and if this is horizontal that's 55 degrees because you can then reduce yeah, yeah. the angle by thread, putting the thread in so that's if I unscrew all that so I wouldn't have normally have it that tight up so that's at 50 degrees so you can or 55 degrees so you can then knock off two or three just by doing that all right then you have the ball head and this was the most expensive part of the whole thing <laughs> Because that was 20 yeah. quid from the camera shop in town. And then I put that, you can see it wobbling there with that rubbish hinge. That's what I want to design out. 
Yeah. So that sits on like so. And then that has, so that's a 12 volt 1 RPM motor. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then that turns the gears inside. So that's got a gear there. That turns that, which then turns that, which then drives the two hinge. So that's pointing at Polaris. So the stars rise and then set. And uh -huh. that's how you reset it. So when you get to the end of the travel, you just got to move the gears back in and just right. squish them together. And I even learned on the CAD software how to put the name on. So when I printed it, it's very professional, yeah. It's good, yeah. It comes off with the name. So that's pointing up at Polaris. And that's just got a big bearing, you know, just skateboard bearings, like you were saying yesterday, just with a big bolt. And I, did, and I was you putting a little polar scope on there, but now I just don't bother. I just just look along the hinge because it's good enough for a wide angle lens. And then fine tune the position. And then the camera's over there, so I can't do that. So I've got 11.9 volts, so it's 6.8, so it's got to be. Aha! Uh -huh. So you turn the rear stat up to 10.2. And then you can hear the motor turning. Yep. I can see it too. And then that is turning well, now. Do you? Yeah, that is now turning it. at one RPM. Yeah. It used to, but I've it's come off now. Is the um a little white dot on one of the teeth, so I could track it round trying to do one RPM. Right. So, anyway, I worked out the mass for that length to so go one degree, 0.25 of a degree per minute. Has to be that long. Right. So you can make it shorter, but then you have to turn it. You know, pr proportionally. Uh, and then you can point that wherever you want. So you can point that at Orion. And then Orion, oh, just leave it, leave the camera running, put the intervalometer in there, go, yay. Yeah. Go and set your telescope up. So the motor itself. Oh, it's even got like a little a pivot point. So you can uh, adjust the, you know, the tension of the, the two. Yeah. So obviously the finder scope set up to go on the refractor. So I put the finder scope on and I was like, brilliant, I've now set my finder scope up. How do you know you're polar alive? So I had to line Swing it up. Yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had to line it up <laughs> and from the top of the garden I could see like a um, like a radio mast or a navigation oh, beacon right, like right. miles away on the horizon. Yes. And I'd line that up as best I could and then <coughs> I had to look yes. through that and then be doing this well yes. of course it was all rocking <laughs> yeah. and make sure the crosshairs roughly went across the same yeah so i'd use this just to check and then i take it off again right as i say some i've heard of drinking straws yeah byros nice. take the pen out of the byro or, or the byro yeah, yeah and just glue it on yeah, yeah that's very good so i put the kettle on you may as well you'd be rude not to wouldn't it So I've also made a time lapse of my neighbour Richard Darn as he observed last night and noticed that the stars are remaining fixed and it's actually the earth, it's the trees in the foreground that are moving as the camera can now track the stars. So while this was running I wandered off and did my own thing. I've been doing some observing and some sketching as well. So the sun is finally out and I'm with Richard Darn and Richard I first met about 15 years ago, where is it, mid 2000s up at the Kilda Star Party? Yeah, that's just about right, yeah, yeah. So you're from, where are you from, Rami? Up, up York, from isn't it? Yorkshire. Yorkshire. So is a feeling out of place down here in the south of England? Well, no, no, I feel quite at home down here. But yeah, no, I love it and spring's often good for weather down here. Yeah, and you get the spring galaxies. Well, it's not very high end really. Is it not? That's pretty good to me. Well, compared with a lot of people. So did you get the imaging? Were you imaging last night while this was? Um, In both. So were you imaging? So you were imaging and observing. Well, I was doing the visual down there. Yeah, on the other side. To do. I keep checking up on it every every so often. So what were you imaging? Like what did you capture last night? Same as I was doing the night before. That um, spirally wiggly galaxy. Yeah. Lovely. Can I go around the other side then and have a look at your? 
Because she's now a vintage telescope. If you like, so back in 1994, this was all the rage. 1994. Oh, look at this. So we just about got the LX200 series out from memory. So that was a Mead computerized one. Well, this is the old fashioned Celestron pushster, if you like. It's got an RA motor, you know. And you so it's tracking. Motor. Yeah. It will track and a um, 9 volt battery will last for ages. But I fitted it with little um, digital setting circles that you often see on big dobs these days. But this, you could buy them for, for this then, back then as well. So um, that computer now is, well, I bought it in 1994, 95, and it's still going strong. Oh, wow. So there's no problem with that. And, but this was a Power Star at C8. So the way the Celestron line worked back then, they used to have a sort of a, a standard, bog standard Celestron. Yeah. Which was, you know, arguably the cheaper version. But then again, everything cost a bit more those days. And then you get the Power Star, which is the Power Star, and this had PEC periodic error correction as well. Um, so, you know, theoretically you could do this for basic, very basic photography. And then the top of the line was the Ultimas. And they're, even today they're quite, um, they're quite sought after. With very sturdy arms and they were made with slightly different um, glass for the corrector plate. But uh, you see them kicking around one, um, once or twice and they're very heavy duty. Wow. But back in their day, they, they were what you would buy if you were avant-garde in astrophotography and you wanted something different and yeah so this one's now you know going strong um, and it still carries on working and it's so basic you know if anything goes wrong with the motor I can just send it to, to one of the guys perhaps here and they'll just swap the motors out never happened so it still goes strong the difference between that and this one the edge which is on the pl imaging platform it's quite marginal actually you'd be surprised really? people make a great deal of differences Actually, you know, when you come down to it and you put them two aside, well collimated and well in ambient temperature, you know, there's not a lot of difference really, frankly. We pay a lot for marginal gains in yeah. astronomy. So uh, back in 1994, that cost me the better part of two grand. Wow. So it just makes you wonder, you know, two yeah. grand these days will buy you fully computerised. But uh, in astronomy, prices in real terms have just absolutely dropped. Like, uh, you know... I know they're going up slightly now, but really, compared with where they were back in the 1990s, early 1990s, what you get for your money today is far, far more. So you leave the one on the far side of the caravan imaging, capturing data. Yeah, so and that one this uses one... Sequence Generator Pro, so I've, I've got to use that over quite a long time. So, by and large, if the conditions are all right, which last night they weren't, there were a lot of clouds cutting through and that halted the imaging process. But it'll recover itself, so the idea is imaging can be very boring. Right. That's all you do is look well, at the laptop. Yeah, just leave it running, don't you? Yeah, so it's best just to leave it running, for me personally, rather than look at a laptop and come out here and, and uh, do the, you know, the, the more old-fashioned thing, which I still enjoy. So what were you, your spring galaxies? You've got the spring galaxies? I did some in Cancer, some galaxies. So I've, I've done a lot of targets. So I'm running, not running short of targets, but I'm running short of the big, bright stuff. So now I'm into the small, fluffy stuff. Right. So we're in uh, Cancer and places like Lynx. Just chalking off galaxies and even the most innocuous looking one on paper. Sometimes there's a partner nearby, yeah. and sometimes you can see them, sometimes you can't. That one you showed me you captured on Friday night or Saturday yeah. night, I can't remember, but it was beautiful, wasn't it, with its twisting spiral yeah, it arms? 30, 3817, I think it is, 3817 or 3718. 3718. And there's little ones in the little L shape, wasn't it? A little group up in the yeah, corner. Yeah, so wasn't it's there? a group, there's a, there's a Hickson group much further back in the background, but. And I did have a look at that last night visually through oh, this. Did you? So I was imaging at that side, looking at this side. Oh, wonderful. And um, it, under these skies, which were very dark last night, I mean, it's a lot of detail there. You know, easy to see, which is rare for an imaging target. Normally they're quite difficult to see. Yeah. This was easy. And the companion galaxy, the big NGC one, was nearby. That was evident. evident. Didn't quite get down to the Hickson galaxies, but they're, you know, have got PGC numbers and all yeah, sorts. Yeah, they're, they're pretty faint, aren't they? Exotic fair. So. So yeah, under dark skies, like anything, and of course I bought this because it's compact, so you can stuff it in the back of the car, you can drive it a couple of hundred miles, if necessary. So this one's done, I don't know how many hours it's logged, thousands of hours under dark skies of North York Moors and, you know, Galloway and Northern Scotland down here. So it's great, it's a big companion. Never oh. sell it because it's no a friend. It's nice when you have that instrument you love that ticks all the boxes, easy yeah. to use, nice optics. Yeah, and it just because I can lift that up and get it into the garage quickly, or you know, if I'm setting up somewhere it? remote, I can be set up in five minutes. 
which you can't do that with modern gears, batteries, alignments, yeah. you know, in some sense of the technology, we've been taken prisoner slightly by it, if you want to rip down and put back up again. But something basic, and uh, it's an 8-inch telescope at the end of the day, compare that size with an 8-inch Dobsonian. Yes, Well, true. that's what drew me to these designs, and I've stuck with them by and large ever since, so the big ones are 14-inch Celestron, so, so these guys are small telescopes really yeah. for me, but... Um, but you've got tracking, you've got a steady mount, you've got, yeah, you say, yeah. uh, easy to use, easy to transport, you yeah. can't house for more, can you? Yeah, it doesn't really, just put a dew eater on the top, and um, yeah, telescopes have to look through, not look at. Could do a bit of paintwork, mind you, nowadays, but... Uh, yeah. You can't see that in the dark, <laughs> can you? can't see that in the dark. <laughs> but, sorry? The other thing about it is, actually, oddly enough, the little items of build quality on this compared with modern telescopes, which really put the modern telescopes to shame. Really? I think the optics have got better more consistent than they were perhaps in this period um, but where we use met uh, plastic today they use metal back right, yeah you know and for some reason the focuser on this which is here is an absolute delight I know you get used to whatever focuser but a focuser should be a combination of stiffness and yeah ease, ease that to tactile move. feel you should have a little bit of, of resistance because you feel when you put it somewhere it's going to stay yeah well the edge is a, probably an optically better telescope than this but its focuser is, is a bit wishy-washy right a bit, you know, it's this focuser, which is ancient, is fantastic. And it's something, I think, the modern iteration of schmidt cassegrains whether it's Celestron or Mead, Mead have got particularly, not so keen on their focus actions, but a lot of Celestrons, modern Celestrons, the focuser and mirror flop actually has got a bit worse, but their yeah. optical quality has got a bit better. Yeah. Whereas this has very little mirror flop and, and has a very, very um, precise focus. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's not all a slam dunk on a modern you know get a modern telescope. There's some things these telescopes did really really well, and the fact that it's still here and still working, yeah, is testament to the fact that I mean they were built to last. And as you well know, a lot of telescopes certainly up until well even now are designed for optimal outdoor conditions, not necessarily the conditions we get in the United Kingdom. Nice and damp and cold. Damp can be very windy. Then we get cold and we can get ice forming very quickly in. in where we go viewing, yeah. Mikiel, their ice will form as soon as the sun's just one degree below the horizon. Is and that when the midges come out as well? Yeah, well, it'll form inside the telescopes. So there you are, Power Star C8, vintage 1994, a rarity these days. And when I bought it, there was only one more in the country, apparently, oh, really? so I was told. Oh, oh awesome. Thank you, Richard. The cover right, is now on. Telescope. Can we go back to bed? I have it bleary eyed. <laughs> oh my goodness. All in code is the same thing. How like did you make these then? Well, not easily. <laughs> <laughs> chuck, chuck those on the end. Were they six inch? Eight inch. Eight, Eight no, inch. These are, these, these are six inch uh, cake pots, all right? Eight inch, <laughs> cake, Eight inch cake pots. Oh, I see. Eight inch cake tins. Goodness me, that's yeah. a beaut. It's a beaut, this is. Make sure they're on. You want to look for them? You'd be very surprised. Oh, if I'd known they were here, I'd have been strand like a shot. So it was wonderful to be at the Spring Star Party, seeing all these wonderful sights, observing through new telescopes, observing with other people as well. Absolutely wonderful. If you do get a chance to go to a star party, I do recommend it. In addition to those classic spring sights, I actually managed to make some sketches. I'm just writing them up now, so I've got NGC 2403, a bright, surprisingly bright galaxy in Camelopardalis. That was a beautiful sight in the little uh, 90 millimeter refractor. And then the other one is the uh, Kembles Cascade and NGC 1502, the little open cluster that's the end. So my apologies for dramatically reducing my output. I've gone back to work, I went back to work after Christmas. So although it's nice to have some more money, I simply don't have the time anymore to produce as much videos. So what I'm trying to do is make some quality videos, fewer but more higher quality videos. And talking of which, it's been wonderful to see the channel slowly grow and to have the correspondence, to have comments from people from all over the world. Absolutely wonderful. So please post comments, let me know if you've got any questions, what else you'd like to see. Always wonderful to see that coming through. Um, I've got some more videos coming up in the pipeline. And in the meantime, I shall wish you clear and pleasant skies and catch you in the next video. It's about one in the morning. I'm talking quietly so I don't disturb everyone else.
but not every animal around here is being so considerate.